welcome and a particular welcome uh, that I'm delighted to make uh, in this inaugural podcast is to Sue Porter. Sue, you are very welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So a little bit of an introduction uh, for Sue. Uh, she has an extensive, uh, distinguished career. Um, so I'm just going to take a few moments to outline uh, Sue's background. Sue has over 30 years extensive experience working in human resource management, uh, as well as operational roles uh, during her exemplary career. So uh, you've also held key roles in HR more widely, as well as being a learning and development professional, working mostly in the UK public sector, both for the civil service and at local government level. And laterally, um, I'm delighted to say Sue worked in academia as a lecturer in management at the York University Management School for a number of years across the gamut and the range of our provision um, from undergrad to postgraduate and making a massive contribution to the life of the school and in particular your work on the master's programs as well so in human resource management. Uh, your specialist interests are leadership, management and talent development and you also had graduated from the University of Lancaster's Management School where your thesis identified the competency required for the senior managers of the future in the civil service and your tutors at Lancaster included the renowned academics John Burgoyne and Mark Easterby-Smith. In addition, you also have had an impressive involvement, so with the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, the professional body of the HR profession, as well as with predecessor organisations since the early 1990s. And you've also had a distinguished run as chair of the CIPD North Yorkshire branch. And as the chair of the branch, you took a leadership role as head of the branch committee and represented the CIPD at a local level. And you also sat on the National CIPD Council, which discusses and agrees CIPD strategy and policy. And while you are now retired from CIPD and from work life in general, I know you're still making a massive contribution to society as well, Sue. So with such credentials, I know you are very well placed to speak on the changes that you have observed across HR during that time, but particularly over the last two years, Sue, since the COVID pandemic, which has affected everyone a time when HR in particular has had to adjust across sectors and contexts as the world of work has changed significantly during that time, not just here in the UK, but globally. So Sue, so without any further ado, we would be delighted to hear more on your thoughts, particularly around uh, those changes and adjustments within HR. So my first question to you, Sue, please, if I may, you have experienced considerable developments throughout your distinguished HR career. What do you consider to be the significant developments across HR as a result of the COVID pandemic? Okay, well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for that introduction. It, um, it sounded wonderful. Um, so I'll try to live up to it. Um, so I think over my time, as you say, uh, in HR, but also in um, operational management, I think um, I've seen a lot of changes, particularly for HR. Um, I've seen it move from being um, an operational personal data keeper role um, to becoming strategic partners. Um, and all the little stages in between on that. From, be, from being a nice add-on um, to, to any organisation, to becoming um, an integral part of business performance. Um, and I've seen it move physically uh, from a small room somewhere in, in an office um, to actually take part uh, on the top table. So yes, I've seen an awful lot of change. That has, uh, that those changes have been what I would call evolutionary. So they've emerged as organizations and the, um, uh, and the profession itself um, felt it needed, felt 
it needed to change um, and become something different. Um, never before have we seen such a dramatic change mm. that the COVID pandemic brought about. Literally, overnight, the world of work changed. Um, and and so I, I kind of see that as more of a forced um, evolution or a revolution even because it was so quick um, and uh, rather than evolving in the ways we wanted it to we were forced to make big changes uh, and I think the HR profession <clears throat> excuse me um, really stepped up uh, and and did an amazing job um, of dealing with what was obviously uh, very much people centric um, situations and issues. So you, you've asked me what do I think were the significant um, developments? Um, I think one of the main ones for me would be. Um, uh, flexible working, which is now being termed as hybrid working. Mm. So when the pandemic hit, um, uh, most people, due to restrictions from government, um, started working from home. Before that, we'd gone to specific locations, whether it be an office or um, a depot, um, or um, in terms of retail, it might be a, a, a shop. Suddenly, we weren't doing that. We weren't going into work. Um, we were doing work from wherever we happened to be um, at the time. And, and that was brought about by the restrictions to stop the infection spreading um, and to protect um, our health services. Um, my, in my opinion, that's never going to go back to what it was before. I mean, if we go back through history, of course, working from home was how we started. You know, way back before the Industrial Revolution, um, little cottage industries um, produced whatever and then went and sold them at markets. So the high, if you think of the hybrid working as a little bit like that, where you have a flexible um, working environment where sometimes you're working from home or, or another remote um, uh, place and then occasionally um, going off into the work situation, an office or a depot situation um, to share with other people. So I think that will probably continue um, and that will add to um, what the CIPD see sees as an important part of HR, which is flexible working. Um, and um, I don't think we'll ever go back to a, a nine to five, particularly moving into somewhere. I think we're going to carry on with that um, flexible means of uh, producing work. Right. I think one of the problems for HR in that is going to be how do we contract for that? Yes, and I think that's How a, did, yeah, absolutely, Sue. Sorry for cutting across you. I thought no, okay. you said a number of really fascinating uh, uh, key points there, particularly that evolution. Have we come full circle uh, in terms of where the world of work began historically and come back to sort of that hybrid sort of homeworking, albeit you mentioned a key point being forced upon us and HR yeah. having to sort of really deal with an unplanned seismic global change. We also yeah. mentioned sort of uh, the strategic element in how HR has developed over the last number of years. And in addition, um, that I suppose that sort of forced that unplanned change, even though HR's profession, as you say, stepped up and really did um, starting work in so many respects, there naturally comes out of that some challenges. What yes. do you consider the main challenges are for HR practitioners while the COVID pandemic lingers? Okay, I, I think that's going to be uh, balancing the needs of the business and the needs of the employees and making ethical 
decisions, mm. ethical decisions based on um, a different world of work that we now find ourselves in, which I, which I mentioned to do with the hybrid working. Um, I think um, so. That that that's that, that's one of the main things. I think I think we're going to have to influence. Um, uh, decision uh, managers uh, and the top managers of the organization into how we make um, explaining to them that balance and making those ethical decisions. Um, we're going to have to, going forward, as you say, whilst it lingers, I don't think it's ever going to go away. Mm. So therefore, we need to consolidate what we know about um, infection control um, and how we cover workloads if people are absent be due to sickness or if they're absent because they have to isolate because mm -hmm. someone else has got sickness. I think that is probably, I think the isolation part, because you've been in touch with the, uh, with the, um, the, the virus, um, will probably gradually slip away, but people will catch it. You know, I think it's going to be a similar situation to the winter flu uh, crisis that comes around each year. Um, after all, they're all viruses. So I think we're going to have to think about how we um, a plan for um, absences because of that, particularly in the in the um, uh, the short term, but also I think even into the longer term, I think it's something we haven't really thought about previously. How Absolutely. do we do that better? Mm. I think that's a, 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 again really key and, and so relevant at the moment, particularly as we hear of um, organisation, a number of key organisations who are changing their policy particularly mm. around sick pay, uh, benefit cutting yes. sick pay, uh, yes. for those who are self-isolating who are not vaccinated um, as yes. well. So yes. IKEA has just announced in the last few days, also Morrison's here in the United Kingdom has also yes. uh, announced that today as well. So lots of change. And, and I think that seems to speak as well so to what you said about are we going to be faced with a situation of living with COVID that it may never go away? It could be sort of as we have had to adjust to the, the flu as well. Um, yes. But that sort of planning again for organisations around vacancies, because it, immensely difficult and challenging for any organisation, whatever its size, to plan when you're also faced with continuous unexpected absences and um, because of the pattern to how the virus uh, plays out. So really relevant. Uh, I suppose that I brings think, us nicely. Sorry, sorry so go ahead. Sorry, can I just come back in on that one? Because I think one of the big things that has come out of this um, is um, uh, mental health issues. Mm. I think we're going to have HR is going to have to look at how we deal with mental health issues, particularly in the short term. Um, I think the pandemic itself has um, increased those issues in many more people than it ever um, than than mental health um, problems ever did affect. Uh, and therefore, we're going to have to be aware of, like never before, um, that these are real issues. Mm. People can be extremely debilitated by things like depression and stress and anxiety, which have been heightened during the last two years, but which could carry on for individuals for the rest of their life. Uh, absolutely, and we're hearing more and more um, organisations having to deal with uh, new medical terms emerging, such as long COVID and attached yes. to that well-being. And, and as that newness in the, in the medical field is emerging, again, another challenge I hear you say there, Sue, of 
working and the, the stress and the frustration for employees trying to get a diagnosis, an immensely difficult time and also an immensely difficult time if they're faced with reductions in sick pay, but also yeah. with mounting household costs and, and living costs that, that are being faced with today. So lots for HR to consider, I'm hearing you say, to yeah, help absolutely. employees in that well-being conversation because it's not an isolated conversation. It reaches into so many domains of their work life mm -hmm. but also their personal life that I'm hearing yeah. you touch on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, and I think whilst uh, the profession has always been a people-centric profession, um, uh, we have, I think to some extent gone too far onto the business needs route mm. uh, that's just my opinion um, and i think we have to redress that balance um by uh, thinking about how putting ourselves in the shoes of employees and thinking about how how they will be feeling at the moment and if we're feeling ourselves anxious um as i know i am anxious and stressed, uh, particularly last year, as you will appreciate, um, a very, very busy year lecturing, um, even though we thought we might not be doing it, um, a very stressful um, and dealing with that stress and anxiety. Um, if we're feeling the pressure of that, then so will other people. Uh, absolutely, and, and really well put, really well put. So thank you so much for yeah. that. And that brings us, I think, naturally to the next question, Sue, around um, what have been the benefits and perhaps the high points, maybe some surprises, um, and maybe some dis any disappointment around perhaps opportunities that have not been fully grasped by uh, HR. You mentioned well-being. I think that's a, a, a nice uh, link into to this next stage of the discussion. Mm -hmm. So from your point of view, Sue, are there benefits for HR professionals as a result of the COVID pandemic? Well, I think first of all, you think, no, there aren't going to be. There are all going to be problems. There are all going to be issues. Um, I think the, the uh, benefits um, are in uh, how we have worked so well over the last two years, how HR became resilient, um, how it uh, became creative and innovative um, in finding ways of working with the restrictions um, that we had. Um, I think it made a lot of us uh, change thoughts and behaviour um, to adapt effectively to that challenge. And um, I think we hopefully, I, I mean, I hope of this, I mean, I've often spoken to um, groups of, of staff that I've trained and, and students that I've spoken to. The, I, I hope that in this case, we have started to forget that this is the way we've always done it. Why would we change attitude um, to a willingness to try different ways uh, of working and to influence managers in accepting that, um, you know, there may be uh, better ways, although it works now. Who knows what will happen in the future? Thinking of how quickly this changed, um, we need to be a lot more flexible in thinking and and hopefully get them to do that. Um, I think if the other thing it for me is if 2020 was the year in which the pro the people profession stepped up to the plate and dealt with the immediate uh, impacts then 2021 and coming into 2022 is the, is the time for the profession to cement its place um, uh, as an integral part of the, the um, strategy and performance of the organisation. Um, and there's never been a better time for us to um, help organisations to build better work conditions for everybody and, and putting people at the heart uh, of the issues of business. I think 
um, a lot of business business executives have have accepted um and I've certainly seen things when I've been reading reading articles and um whatever that they have accepted that HR has done a, a really good job and they would have they would have been in real trouble um had we not stepped up to the plate. So now is the time for us to um to keep that people centric um situation I think. Uh, excellent. And I, I think that what you've just concluded on there and that uh, discussion, Sue, goes back really nicely to what you said earlier, um, that perhaps from your perspective, HR in the past has perhaps moved too far to addressing the business needs and for sure. times the people aspect and the people needs. And so what I'm hearing you say that now perhaps in 2022 is a real opportunity for HR to build in those benefits of 2020 and 2021, where, as you say, organizi yes. organizational leaders that you're in touch with are saying, if it wasn't for the HR profession, they would have been in trouble without their support to really focus yes. and galvanize the people and employees. So a really interesting uh, yes. surprise and development <laughs> in, that, uh, in that context as well. Certainly was. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Moving on to priority areas, Sue, what priority areas do you consider remain for the HR profession if it is to navigate the COVID terrain successfully in the long term? So I heard you say around the people aspect, so I'm mm -hmm. anticipating that that will be one of those key priorities. Anything else that you would like to add to that, please? I think ever ever the trainer and and uh, uh, and teacher, as it were, um, I I sort of think one of the main things uh, that the HR profession needs to do is to listen. That's mm -hmm. the main thing. We start listening. I think we do that really well, to be honest. But I think we need to put more emphasis on listening to lots of different people um so not just what we would have done in the past sort of listening to managers and frontline employees and what they want but i think um particularly with things like mental health issues and with any ongoing um covid issues we need to listen to medical professionals too we need to find out what they're telling us um that seems to have served the government in my opinion um, really well in the last two years to listen to what they're telling us from their research. I think we, we don't have to be medical professionals ourselves, not at all, but we do need to listen to what's happening with that um, and follow that. Um, and then the next thing to do would be to learn from that um, and uh, use our own experiences uh, and and things that we already know to identify what would work best uh, for Correct. our businesses and organisations. I think what's uh, a, a really important point to, to sort of dwell on there is what I hear you say, uh, Sue, is a, re a rethinking in this priority area of who our stakeholders are within the profession yes. and within the yes. organization. Mm -hmm. That perhaps we have sort of relied a lot on those traditional stakeholders, whether they come from a shareholder base, a regulatory base, customer base, et cetera, that now we're having to think more widely and in a more specialist area and really be prepared to have conversations that perhaps are not our domain, you know, being more yes. familiar. We're not mm -hmm. asking HR professionals to become medical practitioners, but to nope. realize we need that specialist knowledge and, and, and input. And I'm reminded a lot of where really the profession was, say, five, 10 years ago, when we were being called to align ourselves and be much more aware with the financial aspect yes. of the business and the budgetary mm. aspect of the business. So I'm hearing echoes of that playing through mm. now as, mm. as, as we look, uh, as you say, to the need to consider the medical profession input as well. So I think that's yeah. a really key area. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we've, uh, what we, we need to work that out for ourselves. And under, I mean, I've always been 
um, uh, an exponent of for myself uh, and other um, people whom I've mentored or managed within the profession. I think you have to. I think that the the CIPD called it being curious. You need to work in areas that maybe don't first or read or um, uh, you know be in touch with and pick up information of areas that maybe don't seem uh, at first to be anything to do with us. Um, yes. But we need to pick those things up and have a wide. Um, a wide knowledge of what's going on, not just within our own organisations, mm. which which we did talk about um, in the last five or ten years, to do with the, as you say, with the finance and the financial side and the business aspects, um, and be more commercially aware. I think we we need to move our focus even further than that now, so that we can. Well, I mean, we couldn't have predicted the pandemic, but yes, what would happen um, and learn from what did happen because of that, if things like that come, you know, come up again, what can we learn from that? But also to keep an eye on things that are happening, because we, <clears throat> I remember, uh, <laughs> uh, just to use one of my own experiences in, in um, January 2020, York, of course, was the first place that had um, two people who who were who had who had caught the COVID nineteen virus. Um, I don't know if you remember, and Indeed. they were in a hotel in York, and it said that they'd come to visit um, the people who 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 were picked up, all in the hazmat suits and things that frightened the frightened the life out of us. <laughs> they'd come to see. Um, uh, student um, at the university and immediately my thought was yes well I've just been to um, graduation day and I was shaking hands and, and speaking to parents of Chinese um, students um, and the information that was coming out crikey are we going to have something like this so whilst I couldn't foresee the pandemic as such I guess it was in the back of my mind where well, this has happened and I think probably a lot of people in York were not totally surprised um, when when it took off so it's about picking up those little things that might mean we have to think about or, or at least keep one eye on what happens with things that perhaps we don't think are in our remit at all. And, and, and what I'm hearing you say as well is, you know, the need to rethink uh, practices and approaches, yes. um, traditional ways of working, etc., while still aiming to be inclusive and welcoming and uh, in all of those respects. Um, mm. Really great point, Sue. Thank you very, very much. Um, this brings us to our last uh, segment, uh, Sue. Uh, uh, so it's gone uh, too quickly. Um, but uh, my last question is, the series um, that we are uh, launching today also seeks to make a free learning tool available mm -hmm. for listeners and viewers. And we just wondered, would you like to say a few words about the resource you have chosen to share with the public today, please? Yeah, um, I think um, most of uh, what I tend to do when I'm when I'm doing any kind of uh, lecture or discussion like this, and I did exactly the same same as I usually do, um, I, I go to see what the current thinking is. So current thinking I can pick up from uh, articles uh, in journals. Um, even newspaper articles in terms of what's happening. So it, uh, a lot of students that I've had um, automatically think that research is going to books. Books are out of date as soon as they're published, in my opinion. So where you need to go are the more um, up-to-date articles and whatever. But I'll, of course, 
as a uh, as an exponent of CIPD, the CIPD website has amazing uh, resources. So they have a particular hub, a part of the website which is devoted uh, and dedicated to COVID uh, and what we can do to help. So some of the resources that I um, picked up and 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 I'm very happy um, to share um, are thought pieces from HR influencers, um, right. either people at the CIPD or um, or, or um, further afield. Um, but the other thing that I can that I have, they have some. Um, guides on on what to do so that so I found um, a guide to managing and supporting uh, remote workers um, a guide for how to plan for hybrid working uh, and um, and I've got those two um, great if you're interested and I can send those over to you that'd be brilliant and we'll make them available on the channel cool. so uh, subscribers cool. can uh, um, have that free download and I yeah. know with the quality of the CIPD uh, guides and supports that would be an excellent resource to people as we continue at this uh, unpredictable time I mean COVID yeah, and, uh, within the HR profession. Uh, that's all we have time for unfortunately <laughs> today so a huge thanks extended to you, Sue. It's been an absolute pleasure to be chatting with you. I wish we had longer. Um, thank you for your time and your generosity in sharing so much invaluable You're HR very guidance today. Hopefully you might consider coming back to chat with us again uh, and to discuss perhaps other aspects of HR yes. and business. So yes. thank you very much indeed, Sue. And bye for now and do take care. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.